from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. This celebration is brought to you by the Hispanic Division of the Library of Congress and the Peruvian Embassy, and the ambassador who is with us now is going to be speaking to us as soon as I'm finished. I'm Barbara Tenenbaum. I'm the specialist in Mexican culture and the recommending officer for Peru in the Hispanic Division. This year is the 100th anniversary of the supposed discovery of Machu Picchu by Hiram Bingham. And there will be events throughout Washington to celebrate the centennial and the announcement that Yale University will return to Peru all of the artifacts that Hiram Bingham brought from that site. It is <laughs> they have already begun to return the artifacts, and they will all be back in Peru by the end of, of uh, 2012. So this is really terrific. Uh, tonight we have with us, this is a very special program, I'm really excited about it. Uh, we have with us Dr. Anita Cook, Associate Professor of Anthropology at the Catholic University of America, and Dr. Margaret G.H. McLean of the U.S. Department of State. And they will be discussing one of the most interesting and special places in the Western Hemisphere, and of course one of the seven wonders of the modern world, and well deserved. Dr. Cook has directed several major archaeological surveys and excavation projects in the Ayacucho and Ica Valleys in Peru, and you see one of her books on the back table. Dr. McLean has evaluated site management practices at Machu Picchu for the government of Peru and currently works with Latin American countries and international organizations to reduce looting and illicit trafficking in cultural property. Machu Picchu, the Inca site most universally known, is considered one of the seven wonders of the world. It is located about 54 miles to the northwest of the fascinating Inca capital of Cusco and lies roughly 8,000 feet or 2,450 meters above sea level, surrounded by the cloud forest of the eastern Peruvian Andes. Part of its mystique comes from the fact that Spanish conquistadores never found it, and the site remained intact from its supposed abandonment in the 1530s to 1911. Scholars now know that Emperor Pachacuti, 1391 to circa 1473, whose name means one who shakes the earth, built Machu Picchu as his own personal estate. Pachacuti is remembered as the most impressive of the Inca rulers, having conquered a wide swath of territory ranging from Lake Titicaca on the present Peru-Bolivia border to Quito, the modern Ecuadorian capital in the north. Hiram Bingham, 1875 to 1956, then a history professor at Yale University, came upon Machu Picchu in 1911 when looking for the Inca capital of Vilcabamba. He always thought it was Vilcabamba, by the way. Bingham, the son of Protestant missionaries who grew up in Hawaii, left Yale in 1917 to join the military as a pilot in World War I. Upon his return to the U.S., he was elected governor of Connecticut in 1924 and U.S. senator from 1924 to 1933. After the National Geographic Society spread the word about his expedition in the National Geographic magazine, Machu Picchu suddenly became, quote, the lost city of the Incas, unquote. However, it was neither lost nor a city. When Bingham and his group stumbled upon Machu Picchu, local farmers were there already, and Augustine Lisa, 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 Raga, Lisa from Cusco, thank you, had visited the place at some point between, I need a pisco sour. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> between 1894 and 1902. Following the speakers, we hope you'll join us for a reception sponsored by the Hispanic Division and the Peruvian Embassy. And now it is my great honor to introduce to you the Ambassador of Peru, Luis Valdivieso. <laughs> Boy. 
you said that you need it. <laughs> Okay, good evening, thank you, and my apologies for being late uh, and keep you waiting. Mrs. Barbara Tenenbaum, uh, Ms. Margaret McLean, uh, Ms. Anita Cook, uh, distinguished guests, uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to this lecture that the Embassy of Peru, together with the Library of Congress, have organized to celebrate the centennial of Machu Picchu and bail into the world. Uh, 100 years have passed since the scientific discovery of Machu Picchu and the spreading of the, its importance through publications of the National Geographic magazine, as was mentioned before, that documented Hiram Bingham's explorations in the regions of Cusco in southern, southeastern Peru. Um, <clears throat> on June 24, 1911, Hiram Bingham, a university professor, guided by local inhabitants, ascended to the heights of one of the valleys overlooking the Urubamba River in Cusco. From there, he saw for the first time the remains of an ancient citadel that was built on top of Machu Picchu Mountain. The construction of this amazing citadel following what would have been a rigorous plan is one of the most spectacular creations of the Inca Empire. Machu Picchu has an immense cultural significance, not only as a legacy from our Inca ancestors, but because it has influenced the Peruvian culture and national identity. The, his, the, <coughs> sorry, the historic sanctuary of Machu Picchu was declared by UNESCO as a cultural and also as a national world heritage of the humanity. This year we celebrate 30 years of the declaration of the historic sanctuary of Machu Picchu as a national protected uh, area. I'm not going to dwell into the details of where Machu Picchu is, as it has been mentioned already. So I'm, but I'm going to go over certain important facts that have been mentioned before also, is that the centennial anniversary of the encounter of Machu Picchu with the Western world co happily coincides with the return of the artifacts that were extracted from the site and exported from Peru during the initial excavation period from 1911 to 1915. 350 pieces uh, the most uh, relevant and intact pieces have been returned already, and they have been shown in Lima and will be permanently exhibited in Cusco. But there are 40,000 more pieces, fragments, skulls, that will be returned over the next 18 months. Um, the restitution of these artifacts is not only important for Peru, but for other countries as well. It's the first time that objects of this relevance and quantity are returned in a voluntary basis by a private organization. There was a memorandum of understanding signed, and that actually uh, puts in black and white a serious commitment to respect cultural heritage. On this basis, President Alec Garcia has convened the second conference on international cooperation for the protection and repatriation of cultural heritage to be held in Lima at the beginning of July. The Lima Conference seeks to deepen the exchange of ideas and experiences of different countries, such as Peru, which have suffered from this uh, uh, problem of having uh, significant and important, and important artifacts uh, of their ancient cultures residing somewhere else. So, um, is it would not have been possible to, to recover many of the patrimony of Peru without the support of international organizations, officers from the U.S. Department in case, uh, Department of Justice, the Homeland Security, and private organizations like the National Geographic Society. It's very important to obtain the support from these agencies and uh, private institutions. Now, turning to the presenters, uh, the distinguished Dr. Anita Cook and Dr. Margaret McLean, two recognized leading Inca and pre-Inca scholars and very dear friends of Peru. Margaret is a senior analyst at the Cultural Heritage Center of the Department of State. She's Peruvian by heart, who has assisted our country to recover hundreds of priceless cultural artifacts illegally exported, including the 16th century altar of Chayapampa, one of the finest carvings by Pedro de Vargas and painted by Bernardo Vitti. Anita is also a friend of Peru, 
She's so often in Peru that one of these days she will need a, to present a visa and return into the US. <laughs> Besides her expertise in the Inca civilization, she's one of the few world experts in the Wadi civilization. She was recently invited to Peru to cooperate with the first studies following the discovery of the first Wadi warlord tomb in the La Convención in Cusco. This is one of the latest discoveries in Peru. And I'm sure she will, uh, hopefully she will refer to it. I, I, I don't want to preempt what she's going to say. <laughs> After the lecture, we will be able to review the, books, uh, the, the book samples that uh, the Hispanic Division of the Library of Congress, represented here by Barbara Tenenbaum, a specialist in Mexican culture and curator of the Kisla Collection and this, uh, the Hispanic Division has organized. Before ending uh, my short remarks, I would like to thank Ms. Georgette Dorn, director of the Hispanic Division of the Library of Congress, with whom we start the coordinations for this event. She's not with us tonight because she's looking after her husband, who had a stroke a few days ago. We wish him a full recovery, and thank you very much uh, for coming tonight. Now I have the pleasure of introducing to you Professor Anita Cook. Good evening. What a wonderful turnout, I suppose, for a very wonderful site. Uh, I am actually going to speak to you a little bit about the precursors of the Inca. I think a lot of the material I might have already, has already been covered that would have been part of my introduction, so I'm going to jump right in. Many of you may already Many of you may already be familiar uh, with uh, Peruvian uh, history and prehistory. If you are, bear with me. Those of you who don't, I will have an opportunity to hear something about the marvelous past of the um, Andean region. And much of what I have to say centers on what we know about some sites. I've selected just a few uh, that mainly are in Peru and Bolivia, but there are other equally incredible sites that relate to the Inca, of course, over five modern countries, uh, which I'm sure you'll hear about um, soon. So the Andes um, is a big area, and from Colombia all the way to Chile to northwest Argentina were the areas that were included in the uh, Inca Empire. Um, as you heard, I'm a specialist, I suppose, of the Wari Empire, which I'm sure none of you have heard of, or very few of you. By the way, there will be a great exhibit here. I'm taking an opportunity to, to do some advertising for the Cleveland Museum of Art on the Wari Empire. So if you're interested in Andean empires, in 2012, you can go to Cleveland and find out more about the Wari Empire. So let me shift to today's talk. Um, let's see. Are we going to keep all the lights on? Yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> Fine. So this is the orientation. Um, on your left is a map of, of course, uh, the western section of South America, the area that basically comprises the Inca Empire. On the right, I've put a map of the same area that includes the empire that actually preceded the Incas. And there's been a lot of talk about the relationship between these two empires. There are some close relationships, and there are some strong departures from one another as well. But much of what developed, even at the time of the Wari, had already been laid down by two to 3,000, if not more, years of high civilization in the Andes. And that's where I'm going to begin. So a very quick overview of uh, time depth. I've chopped off the bottom part of this chronology, so it goes back much further in time. Um, but I start with the very famous little picture of Corral, which is considered to be, of course, the earliest urban city, city in the Americas. And I uh, start there by pointing out the dates, which are 3,200 to 2,800, and then beyond, and, and closer to us in time. But very, very ancient remains with monuments that are astounding. So architecture, the kind of architecture we see for the Incas, starts a long, long time ago. Um, just, of course, a quick shot of Machu Picchu. And a quick overview, just for those of you who don't know this, the Andes is, has a remarkable variety of ecological zones and environments, three major ones. One is the desert along the coast, 
the Andean highlands, and then the Amazon, and in fact, the eastern slopes of the Andes leading into the Amazon. So the diversity of environments and ecologies has played a very major role as well in the rise of these civilizations. And these areas were not isolated. There was an enormous amount of contact between them from very early times. So it didn't, you didn't need a major Inca highway, which we know existed for much for the Inca empire, and also for earlier times, you didn't even need that. You, pathways get you across the Andes still today with great camelid caravans. Uh, early, early monumental architecture. I'm just giving you a very quick cursory view of the earliest time frames. These are the kinds of monuments that people study, particularly in the coast in the North Highlands, all the way to the central coast of Peru. They are what we refer to as pre-ceramic and also the very beginning of the ceramic period. Uh, remarkable friezes are part of that tradition. I just show you one picture here of that. Um, they are um, f huge friezes. They continue inside the arms of U-shaped monuments during this time period as well. Um, and as we move f closer in time, jumping to the first millennium BC, the very well-known Chavin culture, which is centered in the North Highlands of Peru, I will, we will look at very briefly, because it really starts to uh, present an image not only of uh, religious architecture, but also of iconography that holds true all the way up to the Incas. And I should say one thing about these fabulous iconographic traditions and monumental traditions. These monuments are covered in iconography, uh, the ones I'm about to show you. When you get to the time of the Incas, it's much simpler. The architecture is magnificent, um, breathtaking, in fact. But it is an ornamented, excessively ornamented. It's actually the actual stonework that is so exceptional. And there's small ornamentations here and there, little serpents and reptiles that sort of pop out at you. Um, um, so this is the major site of the Chavin culture. It's called Chavin de Huantar. It is a major complex. Um, it is being has been the center of attention for th uh, at least 30 years. In the last 10 to 15, it's been the center of attention of continuous excavations by um, archaeologists at Stanford and collaborators in Peru. Here you can just get a glimpse of the complexity of the architecture. It, below, the, below the main floor of this temple is a series of remarkable galleries within which is the so-called lanzón, which is the, the monolith you see to the right. And you'll see to the left how, um, where it is embedded within the bowels, if you will, of the uh, structure that you see on the upper right. Um, also, just to, oops, am I going back? Nope. OK, thank you. Pointing to the geography and the map on the upper left, here we're starting to see how one particular um, cult, it's been called, of course, there's a very um, important economy that backs up this cult. Sites that share the same iconographic tradition and, and, and similar monuments cover the area that you see shaded on this map. So you start to see large contiguous areas being encompassed within um, polities, if you will, that eventually become more expansive. And now for the beginning of what we generally refer to as complex states, states that were both expansive and ultimately states that in very rare occasions in, um, are considered by many scholars to be the first empire. So what you're looking at here is where Machu Picchu is situated, which is in red. To the north is Wari in the valley of Ayacucho. And to the south, at the southern end of Lake Titicaca in Bolivia, is Tiwanaku. So the middle horizon, which is the time period of the first millennium AD, generally, sort of about 500 to 1000 AD, is when the Wari in the north and the Tiwanaku in the south uh, exist, grow, interact, conflict. Uh, they have uh, very different types of architecture, very different types of subsistence, but they shared a lot of iconography in common, which has puzzled scholars, I might add, for a long time, because we haven't seen a lot of direct contact between these two areas until about 20 years ago when we found on the coast one area where the two polities actually seem to have lived next to each other, not always in peaceful, um, terms. So 
the, um, both of these, the Tiwanaku and the Wari, are, were, let's say, in the 1970s, considered to be states. And they had uh, territories that they expanded into. They, Tiwanaku um, really has an east-west kind of orientation, including the northern portions of Chile, all the way over the high Altiplano, down into the eastern montaña. The Wari, on the other hand, it tended to expand in all directions, north, south, east, and west. Uh, a lot of close contact initially with the coast, uh, immediately adjacent to it. Where I'm going now is just to show you some of the architectural developments. You've seen them now for the very early monumental architecture. I've shown you a photograph or two of Chavin, which is in the north. There's a somewhat different tradition that um, precedes the emergence of Tiwanaku in the south. And they are uh, often, they often are complexes that involve sunken courts. Sunken courts are part of the tradition all over the Andes in the um, Lake Titicaca region. These are um, quite well marked across the landscape and villages. And here you're seeing the kind of monoliths that predate the emergence of Tiwanaku, the courts that are typical within villages uh, uh, still today. These are courts that court, sunken courts that were in, were used uh, somewhere between the first millennium BC on up until the probably the, mainly the first millennium BC. And below, Tiwanaku. So you can see here that a almost 1,000-year tradition of sunken courts exists in, the circ in the, what we call the Altiplano, which is the high grassland area of the Circum Lake Titicaca region. There is a tradition that continues for a very long period of time. And the tradition is well expressed at the capital um, of Tiwanaku, of the Tiwanaku state, which you're seeing at the bottom. Tiwanaku and Wari were contemporary polities. Um, this is just another quick reminder of the transition from the earlier to the later um, sunken courts. But at Wari, we also have um, ritual architecture, and that you're seeing in the lower left-hand corner. And I threw it in here just to show you that they're different. They aren't rectangular sunken courts. In this case, they're sort of D-shaped. They can be circular. They can be D-shaped. They sometimes have interior niches. So the architecture is markedly distinct in, in Wari. Um, and this is a map of the extent of the Wari as we knew it. Up to recent times, it's even more. It's better known today. The blue is basically what you're looking at is the Tiwanaku region, and the orange to the north is all of what we consider to be, today to be the Wari Empire. Here we're starting to look at some things that maybe the Wari developed to such an extent and with such success that it continued to be employed after its demise and um, taken up by uh, governors perhaps of the early Incas as well. There were very important kingdoms that existed between Wari and Inca um, that were also, of course, enabled the continuation of some of these traditions. We believe that when the Wari fell, areas that had governors that were very successful continued in power and probably continued using a lot of the symbols of power that were so successful during the Wari Empire and they continue all the way up to the beginning of the Inca and are in fact employed in some cases by the Inca. Here you're looking at very wonderful textiles that are characteristic of the Wari. They are uh, royal tunics that were worn by different officials of the state. They had four cornered hats. The labor intensive intensity of the that, that's involved in the production of these textiles is amazing. We're starting with very fine, um, the finest wools and alpacas and even vicuñas, the spinning by the best spinners, the dyeing by the best, et cetera, all the way up to these remarkable tunics that sometimes look as fine as silk when you look at them. So tunics were a mark of royalty and a mark of uh, stature and rank for the wari. Uh, they probably were for other cultures, of course, as well. But the, 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 there is a similarity between the Wari and the Inca, which you will see momentarily. The other interesting thing that um, many of you, I'm sure, are already familiar with is that the Incas, although they did not have writing, they had many other mechanisms for communicating, one of which, many of us argue, is, of course, um, 
the ways in which life was designed or material culture was designed, like those tunics with all those designs on it, but also knotted strings, which are called kipus. And these are known for the Inca. They have, there are some early chronicles that have actually deciphered a couple of them. People who were kipu makers told them, read the kipu to the early, some of the early chroniclers. Other than that, we are um, still studying them. We have a crack, uh, Gary Yurton and others have cracked some minor codes, but we have a long way to go. The Wari had knotted string kipus as well. And I have recently heard, although I'm not sure that there is consensus on this, that the kipu tradition may go all the way back to Corral. Um, but that is something that is um, suggested only by those who have worked at the site. The knotted strings, of course, can, do, can be lots of things. They have to really have a good sample to support that. Here, you're, here I'm just going to give you a couple of comparisons to show you why we believe the um, Inca and the Wari have certain elements that, uh, in common that are quite remarkable. One of them is the textile tradition and the uh, royal tunics. And you're looking at just one example of a typical wari tunic on your left. You're just getting a sample of it. And on the right, you're seeing a beautiful Inca tunic that actually is in the collection here at Dumbarton Oaks. Um, Notice that they're very block, they're, they're blocks of designs. They're called toka, tokapus. The Inca called these tokapus. Uh, Sue Berg and I have actually argued that the Wari also had tokapus, and you can probably see how that argument can be played out. Um, the presence of feasting wear was very important to the Inca. They um, offered large feasts at times, uh, at ritual times, at times of harvest, et cetera. We believe from the archaeological evidence that the Wari also practiced, practiced similar um, reciprocity or un unbalanced reciprocity. And you're looking at the jars in which the corn beer would have been served on these occasions. On the left is a Wari jar, again, full of figures. And on the right, you're seeing an Inca a uh, jar that is part of the main Inca imperial wear. Both of these were used on ritual occasions and held large quantities of chicha. They also used, and I don't have an illustration of it here, cups, always often two cups that were identical so that the officer or the official could both toast the son or toast the next person um, at these events. So once again, Inca Cusco lies in the middle of this Wari to the north and Tiwanaku to the south. That's a quick view of Wari. You can't, not very impressive. If you look to the south, you'll get a view of how much more you can see if you visited Tiwanaku. It's beautifully reconstructed. Wari has a lot of cactus and broken walls. Um, it's hard to get around, but some areas, and you probably can see the tin roofs there, cover areas that have been exposed. Monoliths dot the landscape at Tiwanaku. They are wearing the garments full of ornamentation and figures that is so common for the era and that we also see. So Tiwanaku has this, the Wari has this. This whole time period where you have royal officials, um, garments become the mechanism for communicating both narrative and status. This is the well-known gateway of the sun at Tiwanaku. Um, it probably represents the, most, the best known symbol of the uh, Tiwanaku iconography and the iconography of the times. It is spectacular. It is similar to the iconography, iconography found on those large monoliths you just saw. But I might add that despite how popular this image is throughout, the, throughout uh, South American literature, both tourist and academic, there are actually very few real examples of the iconogra iconography we're seeing on the Gateway of the Sun. So despite the uh, draw that this has, and it's quite spectacular and it's quite impressive, and it probably did mean an enormous amount to those attending feasts and, and ritual events at Tiwanaku, that particular display was possibly only for very special people. This is um, coming to Cusco now. There were traditions in Cusco that preceded the emergence of the Incas. Uh, one of the better known ones are, is the culture of the Quilque. It's what their pottery is also called. And you can see, I just put one up here to show you next to typical Inca jars that there's clearly um, a similarity. And I hope you notice that the figures that, uh, that were so um, important for earlier cultures drops out completely. 
uh, during Inca times. You don't have iconography covering the tunics of people who wore them. They were highly geometric. The leaf designs um, were common. Nested um, diamonds and the like were very common. So the tradition of the Inca actually emerges out of a tradition that was already in the Cusco region. And this is a bit of a headache, so don't look too closely. But this is meant to show, this is my attempt to point out to some friends of mine how many pieces of Wari imperial wear also are found in T Inca imperial wear. So to the right, you're looking at the imperial pots that the, gov the Inca and the major governors had at their houses. And on the left, you're looking at what I have construed as the major wares of the Wari. And there's some very, there's some very strong similarities here as well. Um, you will be hearing a lot more about this shortly, but I want to pay just point to the lower right, which is a stepped pyramidal structure. It is currently uh, situated in the second capital of the Incas in Vilcabamba, which is actually close to Wari. And it's one of the best preserved um, edifices of its kind. It's called an Ushnu. And it's where a lot of ritual activities took place. It's where the Inca would come and visit and would would, would come, up, come to the top of this. There's actually two seats that were carved into the top, the stone at the top. And um, here are some very early drawings of it. Obviously, we know how important they were because the Spaniards came in, and I hope you can see this from the old drawings, placed crosses on the summit of the most important buildings, right? So that very wonderful 1847 drawing of the Ushnu that you see to the lower right has a cross plunked on the top of it. It's probably been there for quite a while. And on the lower left, actually, what we're looking at is something that's quite um, Andean and not necessarily Spanish. It can be misconstrued as such, but the worship of mountains and um, the importance of mountains and mountain tops for where ritual activities would take place. And this happens to be one of those important places. There as well, the Spaniards actually did come and plunk down crosses as well. So we actually know which areas were most threatening to the, to the Spaniards when they first got there. To finish up, um, recent research has revealed a lot of sites with Ushnus, with these Inca step pyramids, they can be platforms. Ushnus are either places that were pyramidal in nature, or they were actually also referred to as holes in the ground where libations were made. So the Ushnu, the term Ushnu refers to both things. And depending on where you are in the Andes, there may be more of one and less of the other. This is actually a Wari site that you're looking at. And it looks bizarre, I'm sure. But remember that the Wari temples were round, remember, and D-shaped, as opposed to all the other traditions we looked at. When we excavated uh, it, at this site, at the very center of it and at the bottom were these funny shaped stones, very well polished, very intentionally placed, buried. And they were clearly important. There's a, there's a whole series of arguments about what these might mean. But what really struck me as significant is that my uh, colleagues in Ayacucho and a Dutch colleague, Frank Medens, has been doing a survey of Inca sites in the area where Wari once was. And they excavated, a f and they found in the middle of the Ushnu going down right in the middle, a series of stones very much like these. So there are a series of cosmological connections. There are a series of ritual activities that link the Inca to the Wari, or should I say the Wari to the Inca, even more closely than we had previously imagined. To just give you the last um, couple of slides is the very new finding at the site of Espiritu Pampa, um, where the presumed great Inca refuge was when the Spaniards came in. It was considered to be totally Inca until uh, some Cusco archaeologists did some work there and found that at the site, um, uh, the Espiritu Pampo, everything that was showing up was not at all Inca. It was uh, somewhat rustic, but typical Wari, and then a royal intact tomb and a series of other adjacent tombs we have never, ever excavated. We've never found an unlooted Wari royal tomb. So this, for Wari folk, was tremendous. And for the folks in Cusco, it was equally tremendous, because they didn't expect to have Wari governors in their backyards either. Uh, so these are the excavations. Um, you, may not, you might, in the 
photograph at the top right C, one of those circular structures. I don't have a pointer, so I can't. It's upper left corner. There's sort of a circular structure, circular walls, and a flat side. That's one of those temples that is so typical of Wari. Here is some of the stuff that was found at, in the burial. Very ornate. A silver and a lot of gold, ritual scepters and knives wrapped in gold and silver. Um, and uh, clearly the heartland of the Wari then, uh, 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 of the Inca, had already been p very much part of the Wari Empire, bringing, us even bringing these two empires even closer together. Um, I'll end there. This is, of course, the map of 1877 that reveals the location of Machu Picchu that considerably predates Hiram Bingham's work. And I do not take credit for this research at all. This is research of others, including Mariana Peace. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Cook. I, I don't know about you, but I certainly learned a lot about the connections between uh, Wadi and, uh, and the Inca Empire. Now. Dr. Margaret McLean is going to talk to us specifically about Machu Picchu. Well, thanks for hanging in there. It was fascinating, Anita. Thank you for setting this up so well. And um, the tomb that you, uh, the, the last find, is extraordinary. I hadn't seen any pictures of it. Um, well, let me add my thanks to Georgette Dorn of the um, Hispanic Center of the Library of Congress, again, for setting this up, um, as well as Barbara Tannenbaum for filling in for her, although I think Georgette is actually here somewhere lurking in the room, and especially to Luis Chang, Senior Public Diplomacy Officer at the Peruvian Embassy for um, inviting me and to the embassy for arranging a month of extraordinary activities um, for someone like me who's a complete junkie when it comes to Machu Picchu. This, I'm in heaven. Uh, Dad, I'll be going to the office much in the next couple of weeks, actually. Um, and again, to Anita, thank you for setting this up. Um, okay, forward. I wanted to just take a personal moment here, um, dedicate this talk to uh, a friend of ours, actually. We just lost, I just learned about this today. Um, she passed away about uh, three weeks ago, I guess. But um, Catherine Juline Kitty, as we knew her, uh, was an archeologist and ethno-historian of extraordinary capability and uh, an, an amazing body of work that she put together, and uh, we lost her much too soon. Uh, she really devoted her professional career to um, recovering the voice and history of indigenous people um, in Peru and Latin America generally uh, in, the, in the kind of dark and murky period before 1700. This is not an easy uh, period of time to work in, but she was a master of her sources, and. Um, her work will stand for many years as a tribute to her, but uh, we'll miss her a lot. So I was thinking of her as I was um, just putting the last of these slides together. Um, hoping you can remember what Anita's much better looking maps look like. <laughs> um, you'll see, uh, we don't have a pointer here, so you'll see that the, um, the lifted section of the map points to uh, that the lower central section, thank you. <laughs> so we'll zero in on uh, the area between Cusco and Machu Picchu. So you get or oriented there. Um, so um, I'm posing and then answering a few questions. What was Machu Picchu? Who built it and when? And how was it used? The first three questions. Um, as was said earlier, Machu Picchu was a royal estate. Um, I can tell you all about how we know this uh, a little later on. Um, it was built um, uh, for probably for seasonal use, kind of like Camp David. 
or perhaps a little bit more like uh, the Breakers, the Vanderbilt summer cottage in Newport, Rhode Island, right near where I grew up. Um, in fact, uh, Machu Picchu is an estate with lots of room for guests and extended family and retainers. There's an enormous amount of land um, uh, around the, the central built uh, con constructed area that's uh, well suited to horticulture for the favored foods and um, uh, of the Inca, um, where they grew maize and peppers and uh, quinoa and potatoes and uh, they understood very well by the time this was built in probably in the uh, 1450s. Um, they knew very well how to manage terraces at this uh, unusual um, high-ish altitude around 8,500 feet um, in the tropics. Every few feet of vertical uh, altitude uh, allows uh, almost a different microenvironment, and they knew very well how to manage these things. These were not for massive uh, agricultural production. Keep in mind, these were probably seasonal and just for the family of the chief. Um, and this was the guy who commissioned it. This is Pachacuti Inca Yupanqui. He was the ninth Inca. The first three or four we're not sure really existed, but uh, he, was, he was the ninth, uh, ruled from about 1438 to 1471. Um, he had recently subjugated this area, uh, and I'll show you another map that's a little bit closer in in a minute, um, uh, very, very early on in his, uh, in his reign. Um, uh, got a rather pesky group of uh, locals called the Charcas out of uh, the area. So he was able to build um, a place like Machu Picchu without having it be a fortress. Uh, <clears throat> Royal Estates, and this is uh, the Hiram Bingham's plan of the site. Um, keep in mind that you're looking North is this way. It's really annoying me that I have to look at maps where north is not pointing upward. But <laughs> north is that way. So a lot of the terraces and a lot of the buildings are east facing, um, or the compounds are east facing, taking advantage of morning sun. Um, just a detail to keep in mind. Royal estates were made, uh, built for the person, uh, for Pachacuti and his family. Um, once the, from what we understand, once that person passed away, um, it was still used and kept up by his family. It was not occupied by the next ruler, for example. Um, Pachacuti had several estates, um, but each emperor built his own, um, and they could have more than one. And how is it used? Well, again, uh, we're about two and a half thousand feet lower than Cusco, the Inca capital. The weather is very different. It's much warmer um, and wetter. And one of the things that was done in, um, in, uh, on vacation uh, in the lowlands was hunting, and they would go out looking for cute, fuzzy animals like these. <laughs> the chinchilla and the viscacha. I love this picture of the viscacha. It's got a baby, an adult in the background. The baby is in the front doing some sort of um, yoga position of some kind. <laughs> I don't know. They probably also occupied this site as a symbolic presence, just in case the, uh, the Charcas were thinking about um, coming back and visiting them in some sort of warlike way. Um, I don't know that they hunted for the spectacle bear on the left, but it's, um, this is the habitat of the spectacle bear. It's a very rare, very shy animal, very, very rarely seen. But this is where he lives, so um, it's a good chance that the Inca would value an opportunity to see him. Orchid hunting must have been exciting because there are many varieties and 
an extraordinary array of wild uh, cloud forest fauna. So in addition to what I've mentioned, what, uh, what might have attracted Pachacuti to this place, to choose this place for his royal estate? And then I'll get into how it was built. So again, the climate. Um, this is kind of a delicate picture. Can you see that? Yeah. Um, as I said, it's 2,000 some odd feet lower, um, much warmer in the dry winter season, which is May to September. The site is built along a ridge that's running north-south. So again, it's the ridge is running so that the this slope is east facing, and the back slope, which is much steeper, is uh, is west facing. Um, <clears throat> it allowed them to use the, that great swath of terraces um, for horticulture. Um, another thing that uh, so a lot of this land was very attractive, having soil elevated up off the river bottom was uh, important for them, having a, an excellent source of this very hard granite building stone was definitely something that the Inca would have paid attention to. Um, white, very hard, um, works, uh, works very well for very talented Inca masons. Um, also from various uh, vantage points, both in the middle of the site and on the Machu Picchu Peak, which is sort of above and beyond on the left, and Huayna Picchu, which is the other peak, this young peak, the views from all of these places um, are extraordinary. There are a number of uh, snow caps in the area that were very important um, religious uh, um, landmarks. Um, so the views from the site were um, enormously important for, for the Inca. They also did, um, and I'm not going to talk, oh, I think I went beyond, oh no. Um, what, this gives you a view of the, some of the landscape around. It's a very rugged landscape. It's a pretty sheer drop down to the valley floor, but the terraces um, still do descend. One of the things that Pachacuti favored and in every site that he built, including the city of Cusco, which he was responsible for, um, he looked for opportunities or had his masons and his planners look for opportunities to use bedrock as sculpture. And um, there are many, many examples of this. And a rock like this may have had a little wall around it. It may have been um, built on top of. It may have had little... Uh, stones that fit into some of the spaces that you see. They, we don't know how they were used, but they were used, they were certainly admired, um, and there are many examples of um, almost embraced stones, embraced architecturally stones throughout the site of Machu Picchu and other sites that Pachacuti built. One of the other things uh, about views is the opportunity to use certain uh, positions of buildings um, to see or to mark uh, certain dates on the calendar. This was, um, I don't know very much about this particular subject. This is a slide I've borrowed from a friend of mine who's an archaeoastronomer. Um, this is a, a, the, a, a sunbeam coming through a window. Um, uh, there's a plumb bob uh, suspended from the top of the window, and it hugs that very straight line of that cut rock, and this is the summer solstice. So he infers that there are some alignments that have been um, made so that a person, for example, who was responsible for keeping time, keeping the calendar, would know by arranging certain 
um, strings and um, watching, paying attention to certain shadows in, in a temple structure like this one, which is a circular temple I'll show you a picture of later. Um, uh, so these could be used as uh, sort of timing devices, if you will. So there were many uses for the stone. Another thing uh, that uh, Pachacuti would have looked out for was a constant uh, source of water, not um, necessarily at the bottom of the site, which is a long way down, but rather a spring um, at the top. And uh, there's a um, Kenneth Wright, an engineer who's been looking at the water at the hydrology of Machu Picchu, has calculated that the spring that feeds the site um, uh, can run from six to about 35 gallons a minute through the system of 15, um, 15 or 16 fountains that are at the site of Machu Picchu. That's a picture of one of the fountains. That's another one, a little bit easier to see how it works. Um, and the fountains are actually Those are all the fountains. And these can be seen at any, at any of the sites um, that, that Pachacuti is responsible for. Um, he loved running water. It's uh, obviously it's a very healthy thing to have a source of water that's a live one and not a standing one. Um, so he's got, uh, as far as resources here, fountain, well, spring-fed uh, fountains. He's got a quarry. The, um, up in the left-hand corner is part of the quarry, the sort of jumble of stones. Um, no stones had to be brought up from the valley floor or anything like that. Um, the house groups you can see, um, there's mostly single-roomed houses that are scattered around, mostly taking advantage of these terraces. Um, it's important to, when you spend time at the site, you can look carefully and see that um, in order for the site to be built, it had to be very carefully planned first, and almost everything had to be planned out before anything could be built. That certainly is true for the water system and the drainage system. Um, this can be a very wet site, so there is drainage underneath the main, uh, the main central plaza, which is not visible um, from the top. Um, there are several drainage systems um, that shed water off the eastern uh, edge of the site um, so that it doesn't disrupt the architecture. <clears throat> Uh, this is just to keep you um, keep in mind that the Cusco Highlands were very cold in the winter, are very cold in the winter. Um, and it's, it's much more pleasant um, down in the lowlands. Uh, so back to the structures, and this is back to my question of how were these things built? Um, Inca masons, this is just following on what Anita was saying earlier, the Huari and, and previous cultures did extraordinary things with, um, with um, ceramics and with textiles um, and wood. And the Incas were sort of the, like the equivalent of, a, of a certified public accountants. They, had, they were creative on some levels, but mostly they were brilliant at administration. They were brilliant at planning and building um, and organizing. They used, they had very talented weavers, but weaving was not their strongest suit. Building was their strongest suit. And Pachacuti was probably one of their ablest um, as a planner. Um, 
I'm going to show you a number of Inca walls, hoping that you develop the same fascination for these things that I do. Um, this is just one kind. This is a very rustic type, um, but it's pure Inca. It's dry laid. Um, it's a very heavy duty um, support wall. There are maybe 10 levels of architecture above this. So this is a retaining wall that had to be very sturdy, seismically stable, um, and almost locked together. And this is one of the things that they were very talented at. Um, this is a, uh, the basic Inca house group um, would be either two or three or more single room structures around a central court or a corridor. Um, I think that's sort of clear. Um, and this, this format, this um, type of, of building construction, you can see in, in places from the humblest um, house groups or conscious to a temple group. Um, here's an example of uh, one such building at Machu Picchu. The lintel is in place. Um, a lot of buildings, if you've seen, I recommend, by the way, that you go over and look at the uh, photographic exhibition that's up at National Geographic now, um, photographs from the Bingham expedition in 1911 of Machu Picchu right after it was cleared for the first time. You'll see that a lot of buildings are still standing to their full height. All they're lacking is roofs in many cases. This was one of the buildings that is um, still in very, very good shape. They haven't had to dismantle it and remantle. Um, you can see the, uh, the stone lintel across the trapezoidal doorway, perfect Inca walls. Um, and this was one of the single room house groups that would face onto a central court. And here you can see the same kind of thing, the same um, uh, building blocks, if you will, single room houses can be larger and smaller. Some have niches in the walls. Some have gabled roofs like the one in the center. Um, some have flat roofs and they would have um, uh, gable roofs that would sit on top, would be tied down. Um, here again, you can see sometimes the scale is different, but the building blocks are the same, the, the basic elements. In this one, if you look closely, you can see a number of different kinds of wall types. Here you're looking toward the north side of the site, and in the middle you see uh, two houses facing each other, and they flank. Uh, that's the passage over to Huayna Picchu, the peak at the top there. And there's a road that goes um, around and all the way to the top of that peak. I should have asked this earlier. How many of you have been to Machu Picchu? All right. How many of you want to go back? <laughs> OK. Um, did, uh, yeah. Did, did everybody get to the top of Huayna Picchu that wanted to? Yeah? It's not, it's, it's a little daunting, isn't it? It's very pointy. <laughs> I've, I've had the unfortunate experience of having it being pouring rain on a couple of times when I tried, and it was uh, a little scary. You can slide a long way <laughs> on this. Uh, that's just a close-up of those two facing structures. And this is a, a view from the north end of the site, looking back toward the south end of the site, and you see some of the, this is the sh more sheer drop on the west side of the, of the site. It's much more difficult to build in, but they managed to put in some terraces. Um, and then the terraces that you see in the, in the middle distance are farther away than you think. Um, Here again is an example of a boulder that's been carved in, in kind of an enigmatic way. 
the three um, step-like things on the right might have been steps, might have been bedding for stones. Um, it may have been an altar. One doesn't know, but these are scattered all over Pachacuti's empire. This is the um, this is the the round tower. Inside of this was the stone that has that stri very straight edge that they have been uh, uh, proposing is was used as a calendrical device. One of the things that Pachacuti was brilliant at, and that you see at every single one of his um, commissioned structures uh, or compounds, was this building into the landscape. He did not miss an opportunity to integrate architecture into the bedrock. It has the effect almost of um, imagining that the architecture grew out of where it was rather than having been placed on top of it. Um, it's, um, it's a feat in itself. Here's an example of um, how not to be uh, overwhelmed by a large rock. Um, instead of trying to move the bedrock or um, get it out of the way, they just made it into part of the staircase. And so they were not obstacles, they were things to be used. Underneath the, um, that circular tower is what was probably a, a burial chamber. Um, it's hard to tell the, the, um, the sort of mythology from the Bingham expedition um, is one thing that there are sort of fantastical names given to the buildings and to sectors. Um, so it's a little hard to know exactly what was there. Note taking was not great. Um, so it could be um, that there was a wall, a stone wall that was fitted into the piece of bedrock that you see has, looks like a little staircase. This may have been covered over um, with a very fine wall, but inside, I guess I can't really see what's inside. There are, um, it's superb stonework and there are tall niches maybe this tall, um, where a, bu a mummy bundle might have been um, put, a body uh, flexed uh, might have been put and um, taken out occasionally or not. Um, I don't think uh, there was anything in there when Bingham opened this up. Bit difficult to see, but it's just an example of a of a an enormous piece of stone that's carved into one whole wall of this temple structure, um, and an example of a piece of bedrock that's locked into a wall. This, of course, is a very good strategy if you're working in a seismically active area, which they were. And another example of. Um, bedrock incorporated into a structure. This would have been a two-story building um, or a two-level building. So how did they cut and shape the stones for the fine stonework that you see there? Well, here's the guy who knows. Um, I'm irrelevant here. The guy sitting at my back is Jean-Pierre Protzen, who is the fellow who figured out um, pretty much how the Inca dressed the stone. They didn't use metal tools. They didn't pour some magic butter over them and melt them so they could shape them with their fingers. It was a very simple, difficult, but simple process. Um, and it was percussive. So um, you start with a, a blank, basically a, a modified stone and then you make it into the shape that you can without wasting in, uh, stone, without wasting energy. And he found that um, you don't just have to smash the pounding stone onto the stone that you're dressing. You almost just drop it and then pick it up again because it does bounce. Again, this is granite. He's using a slightly harder stone, which he found at a quarry. Um, 
And so it's a matter of guiding the stone when it bounces rather than smashing the stone so that it takes chunks of stone off. Um, each stone in a dressed stone wall is custom made. And the bedding layer, the lower level, the lower layer, was dressed to fit the incoming stone. And I'll show you what that uh, looks like. Here's Jean-Pierre looking quite chuffed that he's put together two stones that fit perfectly. Um, these are the, you can't fit a razor blade in between the stones sort of fit. Um, and here's the, one of the early pounding stones um, that he found at a quarry in uh, Ollantaytambo. We can use this as, as an example of, um, of a wall that's built this way. If you look at each of the stones, you can see they're kind of pillowed in a way. Not all walls had the same surface finish, but all of the walls were built in the same way um, by all the Inca stone walls were built in the same way. So if you look at the bottom of a stone, it can, it's often quite level, but it fits in to a space that suits it. So it's um, the bottom stones were carved out. So a stone would be uh, partially dressed and then fitted or tried. Um, it's a very, very much a trial and error process. So tipped into position, um, stone dust or pollen or some other kind of uh, dust material could be put down and then the stone could be lifted away and you could see, it's sort of like when you go to the dentist and you see where a filling has been, yeah, you sort of have to bite down on that carbon paper. It's the same sort of thing. So if there's a place that's protruding on the bottom, then that's uh, smoothed out so that the top stone is then fitted into place. So in each case, that's done for each of these stones. So when, whenever you see an Inca wall that, that has this sort of, it looks like the stones have sunk slightly into their places, that's a, that's a good Inca wall. I'll show you a few others. The stone in the middle, this triangular stone, is almost like a keystone. Sometimes these fall out, but this, the wall doesn't necessarily tumble if it does. Um, but you see in, in the larger stones on the bottom, that's sort of the, the bedding level, and then the smaller stones um, on top, this is a wall of a structure. Um, the terrace wall is below it, and then the wall of a structure above. And you can see how they look like they've sunk slightly. The same, exactly the same technique is used. This is a wall in Cusco, also a Pachacuti extravaganza. Um, this is the famous stone of the 13 angles, or whatever it's called, um, up in the um, upper part of Cusco. Um, but it's made in exactly the same way. The stones are larger, um, and in the case where the stones are much bigger and heavier, sometimes these nubbins that are protruding on some of the upper stones, they were probably used, according to um, another genius who've wor who's worked on the stones um, by the name of Vince Lee, who lives in Wyoming, another architect. Um, his theory is that these may have been used to help with the um, taking, balancing the stone out of place while the bedding layer is carved out a little bit and then leveraging back or levering back uh, the stone into place. And in many cases, these nubbins were um, pounded off before uh, the wall was finished, but in some other cases, they were not. This is an example of where they were not. These are enormous stones that built, uh, that construct a, corners, a corner of a palace structure in Cusco. Um, this thing didn't move. Um, there was an interesting case study when um, in May 15, 1950, there was a, a huge earthquake that hit Cusco and um, most of the Inca structures stood fast and most of the Spanish superstructures um, took a very bad hit. So it was a really interesting opportunity for a number of archaeologists, um, John Rowe being one of them, who's a, a sort of famous Inca scholar and 
archival detectorist. Um, he was uh, sent down there on a UNESCO mission, I think, and had a very interesting time studying the seismic stability of, of Inca construction right after that earthquake. Another fine example. Um, Ollantaytambo, which was um, another place that Pachacuti constructed uh, and probably didn't finish, um, is a, uh, a wall that has um, a different sort of face to it. It's much flatter um, than the stones still have the nubbins on them. And this is one of my <coughs> favorite pictures. You can't really see that's a, those are seams there between stones. Okay, I'm gonna try to wrap this up quickly. Um, so, were there other places like this? Yes, there were. Pachacuti also built uh, a royal estate at Pisac. Um, and if you look, this is gonna be hard to do without a pointer. Maybe the best thing to look at is the valley floor. This is an aerial photograph, if you haven't figured that out. The valley floor, uh, the, see the wavy um, terraces along the floor. The, the river was canalized here for about three and a half kilometers. That is, it, they built stone channel walls so the river would stay within the walls and not create havoc in the valley um, and allow agriculture to flourish um, on these terraces. There are terraces, uh, straight and curved terraces that go all the way up one um, side of a hill and there's a, uh, yeah, kind of way above where, where Anita was pointing um, is the top of the hill where, the, where a little palace structure was built. And then there were several compounds associated with Machu Picchu that tell us a little bit more about the estate. Um, how many of you have walked the so-called Inca Trail? All right. Um, these, the sites that you saw along the Inca Trail were part of Machu Picchu, in a sense. They were where, um, uh, where the retinue of the Inca, the Inca Trail um, doesn't follow the actual Inca road for part of its way, but between Runcuracay and Sayacmarca, which you see there, that's where another road came in, um, and then the Inca road does follow from there. It follows the dotted lines. Um, and I'll show you a few pictures of the road, and then I'll show you um, one of the sites along the Inca trail. This is the last chunk of road that leads into Machu Picchu. You can see Machu Picchu in the distance. Um, this happens to be a group of my porters. They're getting ready to carry my field camp up uh, to one of the sites, but they look um, and are dressed probably pretty much like porters of old might have been. Um, sandals and um, knee length uh, breeches and um, incredibly strong and uh, they know how to use the, they know how to use the roads. There were probably um, two or three roads that led to Machu Picchu. At least one was a wide um, road that could uh, carry um, two or three people abreast. Um, the other roads would be single file roads. This is a back road into Machu Picchu, which I think is a pretty much a single file road. Um, that's a, that is a drawbridge. And the reason that it had to be a little wider in some, uh, in, in at least for part of the roads, um, this would be an Inca and his consort being carried in a litter and two people in front and two people in back, um, that requires a couple of meters. So um, this is a photograph, it's a little hard to read, but you see in the distance like a mirage the site of Sayak Marca with a road, that white road um, being one of the formal wide roads. Um, that was one of these way stations along, the, uh, along this so-called Inca Trail. There's a tunnel 
that you're looking at from the bottom up and from the top down. Um, probably a single file. I don't think you can get a litter through that uh, little hole. This is a, um, uh, just a stretch of road that's um, sort of a shortcut, definitely uh, ink and construction. Um, it's important to note that for the formal roads, the wide roads, um, they were punctuated by platforms off, this, off to the side. This is a zigzag, as you saw the, the kind of uh, landscape that this was going through. It's a zigzag road. Uh, but every now and then there was a platform off to the right or off to the downhill side from which other platforms like that could be seen. So this offers an opportunity to use smoke or fire to signal ahead that there would be um, another, there would be, there's a, you know, retinue coming in the direction of Machu Picchu, warning them of an approaching party. Couple more uh, pictures of, the, of a wide road. This is um, uh, about a two and a half meter wide road that is built through a swamp. Um, and that's a regular sized human being at that angle there. So you can see how high the structure is to support the road. The idea of, of the Incas was to keep the road as level as possible, um, whether it, uh, went through a, if it went, if a road went through a place like this, they would raise the level of the road to where it had to be in order to get through a whole stretch. They didn't like going up and down and up and down. So they, they went up when they had to, but they stayed up as long as they could. Another stretch of road. In some cases, the road was much wider, but the vegetation has crept in. And in this case, there's a, quite a steep drop off on the left. Um, and the roads could be supported by up to um, 10 meters of, of terrace wall, basically, to keep the road at the right level. One of the other things that was, the roads were used for in this area, most likely, was to carry the mummy of the um, deceased ruler. And this may have happened with Pachacuti. Um, so this was a two-man litter rather than a four-man litter, uh, one riding and two carrying. They did take them out for walks and festivals and processionals and so forth. Fed them and dressed, redressed them. So last thing I want to show you is uh, an example of one of these sites, I think uh, an extraordinary one. It's in ver a very good state of preservation. The first thing you come to at the site is a fountain. And this was a land or, or, or a um, very common thing for um, one of Pachacuti's sites. You come first to a fountain, a bath perhaps. Um, there may have been some sort of ritual bathing that was done before you entered into a site. Um, so that's... Uh, that's one of the standard things. And this is um, a long view you can see in the far left hand corner, farthest on the left, is where the fountain is. So you keep walking in and there's uh, a series of five other fountains, a drainage channel. This was a very compact site. I doubt um, there was a lot of horticulture going on here. I think the terraces may have been used. They're so, they're so full of bedrock. Um, they may have just been used to stabilize the architecture. Um, the arch most of the architecture is around the side. Um, even though the, um, the terrain was very uneven, they still use these single house structures facing each other. You can see a couple at the top. Um, it's still the same building blocks. This is taken from the down side. I was before I was up at the top looking down at the site and now I've gone around a corner looking back at the site. So you can see how, um, how deep the site is. And there are just a few house groups in the middle, um, but it's, it's like a barnacle. It's a uh, little places like ho holding on to the landscape like barnacles. 
it's an extraordinary place. It has, um, uh, that's looking at someone's pockets ringing. Um, just a shot of uh, one of the house groups and you can see how the signature of Pachacuti is definitely here with the building almost growing out of that granite bedrock. And all of the stone wall that you see on the right is just to support a very small single room structure at the top. So that's my last picture. Some of my sources, Vince Lee, as I said, is the guy who figured out how to put together the stone wall. Jean-Pierre Protzen, who figured out how to make the stones. Jo Johan Reinhard, I recommend any of these people for you, by the way, for reading. Joe Reinhard, who's a National Geographic explorer, is um, uh, an expert in the mountains and the meaning of mountains to the Inca. Kenneth Wright is the hydrologist engineer who's been working in the area. Susan Niles knows everything about uh, royal estates of the Incas. And John Rowe was uh, the, the Mr. Inca and the, probably the best um, archival detectorist in the world. So happy, happy 100th anniversary. We want to thank uh, our two panelists who were so brilliant tonight, the ambassador, of course, the Embassy of Peru and the Hispanic Division for this fantastic program. And uh, if you can quickly grab a drink or a, a cookie, uh, I would suggest that you do so. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.